We're going to delve into a battery conversation now, one where, again, we're going to invite you to shift and shape the conversation. So jump into Slido if you've got a question that any of that prompted or something that you've come in with as well. I want to make sure that we make this a, a safe environment to ask whatever question we might. So jump in and do that. Please, in the meantime, join me in welcoming back to stage Simon, Christina, and Olivia. Or Christina, I should say. Uh, I think I'm trying to remember my order. Christina, Simon, and Olivia, in that order. And also joining them is Nico Cuevas, the chairman and CEO of Urbix, a company founded in 2014 that produces natural battery-grade graphite. Can you join me in welcoming our four fabulous panelists? <laughs> welcome, welcome. I love that you're appropriately dressed for Peace Day, Christina, too. Very fitting. Come on out. Welcome. Oh. You set up one hell of a panel conversation, the three of you. Um, and Nico, I might give you first chance to jump in before we start turning to some of the questions I've certainly got and to our audience questions. I mean, you heard the three talks, obviously. What for you resonated, or is there anything that you'd add in when you think about the framing that we've got for this panel, ethical batteries from mining to recycling? What do you want to throw in the mix for conversation? It's a lot of it. I couldn't hear very well. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, after hearing the three talks, what would you like to add into the conversation? Is there anything that really stood out and resonated for you, or is there something you feel like you want to throw in that maybe hasn't already even been mentioned? Sure. I I believe that, hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here, uh, fantastic event, it's, 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 uh, it's truly uh, inspiring to be able to, to, to be here with this, this panel, very, very, very uh, successful leaders here. Um, I would like to echo uh, the word pragmatic in this sense that you mentioned, Christina, at the end of your, of your, of your presentation. Uh, we tend to get too involved and too carried away with the ideological aspects of this energy transition, decarbonization, hugging trees and things like that, with completely overlooking uh, what Simon mentioned, which is uh, that batteries mean mines. And he did say sustainable mining, and I think that's the approach that we've got to consider. Not only mining, but what happens after you mine the material, which is the mineral processing. So uh, you guys pounded on this in, in your presentation, safety component as well. So uh, I'd be just repeating if I keep on saying that. But uh, uh, the importance of midstream processing and understanding that uh, the capital must flow into this uh, company so that we can achieve our energy transition goals. I want to talk about that, the kind of the future is mining, because I guess Olivia and Simon in particular, you had interesting frames on that. I think, Olivia, yours was coming a little bit more from a cause for concern. You're looking at the state of play when you showed those charts at the end around the climate vulnerability, uh, the association of some of the countries with corruption, fragile economies, things like that. And then, Simon, when you look at the projection of what's required, the reality that not only is it the existing footprint, but how much that's going to have to grow. I'd just be interested for your observations around how well these challenges are being lent to and into at the moment? Because, Olivia, I know you talked about here's the things we need to do. Is that underway? I mean, Simon, you outlined we've got a three to five trillion dollar capital challenge. To what degree are we leaning into kind of the political challenge that's sort of inherently in this mix as well? Well, it's an interesting thing because we were just briefly talking about this with Simon backstage. What's been interesting for a really long time about the decarbonization conversation is that we were focused on pledges. How do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions and how do we particularly reduce them in energy intensive countries? Again, mm -hmm. the US, Canada, um, the OECD world, essentially. And that led to a conversation where it was all about trying to harness and incentivize the private sector, particularly in the new wave of technological expansion, as I was saying, which is essentially the backbone of the new wave of economic growth. The problem with that is that countries in the OECD space put a lot of onus on the technological and industrial ecosystems, mostly the technological ones. Mm. The whole challenge was essentially about how to become better battery superpowers, better, like, you know, to make better solar systems, better windmills and things like this, without ever fully taking into account the supply chains behind all of this because we were on top of it thinking, or we were living in an era where we believed in the power of globalization and we believed that it was here to stay. 
this has changed. A whole sort of set of ideological values and ideas are now crumbling. And that means that we need to look at the notion of supply chains from a strategic perspective. And that requires having Europe, the US, Canada look at these countries which have often been considered as being marginal in the economic system. They were the underdeveloped, they were the fragile ones. We never really sort of delved into the paradox that actually these countries have always been at the center of power systems, of the economic models, and that we actually depend on them, not the other way around. So it's reversing those power relations, which is going to be quite dramatic in the next decades, and will require us also to sort of change the way in which we think about these notions of technological powers and economic powers. So I'm going to be interested in your view. I mean, you're advising, you're sitting on advisory boards for a couple of governments. You know, obviously the, the economic lens and the reality of trying to shore up your uh, energy future in one regard. How much of the conversation is also about the shift in the geopolitical balance and the potential conflict situations that might eventuate as the balance shifts with the forecast in, you know, in energy, kind of mineral intensive pockets of the world and, and how that might play out? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, I mean, the first challenge has been addressed the last sort of 12 months, which is, okay, we need to build these battery plants. Then the realization is, we need this volume of raw material. Then you realize they're tiny industries and they need to scale 10x in, in a short amount of time in under a decade, effectively, mm. to feed it. And then they go, well, where are these raw materials coming from or where they could potentially come from? Mm. And um, I mean, cobalt in the DRC is perfect, a perfect example, right? is that you won't get cobalt in the volumes um, you need anywhere else but the DRC. Yet, um, you can build hundreds of mines around, well, let's say tens of mines around the world, cobalt with nickel or, um, but you won't get, they're still very small. The, the concentration of cobalt is very small outside of the DRC. It's quite a, a unique place. And so, you know, if you're, if you're like the US government or Canadian government, you're doing these deals, you should be going to do deals with the DRC government to help countries like that actually develop a sustainable infrastructure, mm. um, a transparent infrastructure to, to be able to grow and add, get, capture more value within that country. The problem is at the moment, there's no real talk on that. There's a little bit of talk, but not much action. Mm. It's almost like that's the next phase is, first they're trying to solve how many mines can we build in North America? How many mines can we build in, in Europe? Then they'll realize, actually, um, the next step is going into countries that are higher risk. Countries like BHB Billiton and, and uh, have run a mile from the DRC. Mm. They will have to go back in and work with the government and create new structures because you're not going to have a choice. Mm. I don't know if that answered the question, but a flavor of kind of where it's at. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like there's a, a parallel in a lot of what we're hearing this morning is what Gillian Tett was talking about yesterday. She was talking about the idea of what's hiding in plain sight. I feel all three of you in your TED Talks in different ways have talked about things that we should be seeing now, that otherwise we're going to turn around in a decade and go, oh my gosh, how do we let this happen? And Christina, that was one of your points around safety, right? You know, we can see this already. We're not having enough of a conversation about it. Why is it something that we're not owning more and leaning into as a challenge, do you think? So I think change is hard. Uh, but just tying into your previous it. question a little bit, we are missing the goal completely if we think everything will be mined from scratch. The circular economy, I've been the chair for the Future of Energy for World Economic Forum. I've donated a lot of time into World Economic Forum. We've had that discussion for 10 years with heads of states. Circular economy means absolutely be mindful of what you mine, but really be mindful of how it's used. Mm. I am delighted to say that the United States government now is very interested in uh, facilitating a recycling discussion. So, in the technology that I showed you earlier, you have a design element that is easy to recycle. So we can have that idea going forward. In fact, resources are only constrained if we throw them away and we have to go back and dig out new. Why not make devices, make this era of energy storage? So metals today are highly priced, easy to fit into the economic framework of today, and very, very effortlessly, you can have a hub and spoke model with, basically, you can set the mine wherever you like, where you have green, clean energy. So 
I live in New York, so we have Niagara Falls. How cool is that? You have clean energy all the time. They fall all the time. So you could have that as a recycling center. There are many others. But the point is, we have to think about the question differently. So groupthink is very dangerous. If we acknowledge we have little time, raise the bar. We have to find ways to either stretch the economic framework or fit into it. I'm suggesting you need both. And you can make very, very sustainable manufacturing. You can make very, very sustainable thoughts on the circular economy of deployment and reuse. But we've got to change how we evaluate that. Do we put a value? Do we put a price on carbon? We've tried that for many years. We didn't really succeed. We probably have to do that. But we also have to change our own mindsets. How do you see a product? Why are we throwing away the opportunity to say, oh, carbon is so cheap, I can just throw it away? Why not use the carbon resource to refurbish, to reuse? Why not? Love that, Nico. Welcome any thoughts on what's been shared, but I also might throw you the top question uh, from the audience here, which is how do we ensure we don't repeat the same mistakes of mining energy resources as we transition to net zero? Any thoughts on that? Well, it seems that every six months there's a new acronym being put out uh, in terms of sustainable development goals, a stated policy, uh, net zero scenario, and there's going to be more scenarios. They go up like gigafactory announcements every week, right? So um, mining energy resources is going to need to happen. I, I will take, uh, I'll keep on going from your comments, Christina. Um, I think Mining, typically in the States, when a mine gets announced, it takes 12 to 18 years to become, to get up and running, right? Uh, permitting and things like that. That's according to the International Energy Agency and things like that. So uh, be mindful of that time frame. There's plenty of locations, plenty of allied nations that we could actually tap into. Um, that much rather get the money from a, a, a North American or a European type of uh, a government program than they would from China. Um, why? Because at least for now, we, we go in there with an investment promise that we will develop beyond the mine, the community, and things like that. So uh, that is certainly an advantage that we, as North America and Europe, will always have over China, period, right? So we got to take whatever little we can have so that as we develop these mining projects, uh, we are able to sell those added values. Um, incorporating into mining, we shouldn't just say mining, 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 mining. There's also the recycling component. Uh, and when we talk about recycling, alluding to your statement, Christina, it shouldn't be only focused in recycling the minerals. It's recycling the components and figure out what other applications you can give to those minerals so that you keep that circularity going, right? Um, to give you an example why we shouldn't only focus on recycling the minerals. There seems to be a shift or announcements, if you look in the news, depending who you ask, from NMC chemistries into LFPs. Why? Because uh, many things. But NMC itself has a high density of highly priced minerals in it so that when you recycle those minerals, you could actually make a business out of it. LFP, not so much, right? So that's when you got to start thinking a little bit outside the box so that when you do a recycling alternative, you are able to figure something out that goes beyond the recycling of the minerals. Repurposing those, maybe another application, put them in Christina's uh, shell module there, there so they can keep on performing for a lot longer. So that's the sense of circularity and, 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 and the sort of like the perspective that I have on mining that it needs to be supported uh, by a sustainable, kind of call it a, a periphery yeah. of other uh, strategies to be able to achieve these goals. I might pick up on your comments around gov government and sort of the advantage of North America. Simon, you mentioned up front, uh, you're sort of saying there's a, a unique opportunity that Canada have uh, with their position here um, to be able to be the gatekeeper for North America's uh, critical uh, sort of EV future. I want to ask you about the question the audience have come up with, which is what are the top two things the Canadian government needs to do to protect, promote that sort of opportunity, I guess. But I'm also interested in, you made a comment, you alluded to, we might get into it later, the difference between mining itself and then the minerals processing. Can you maybe delve into that part of the equation too? And is there an opportunity for Canada in that part of the value chain? Yeah, so good question. Um, so the first thing the Canadian government should do is match kind of rhetoric or now what looks like policy with, um, with the realities of getting these mines actually up and running. 
permitting, permitting, permitting. Same in Australia when I was there a month ago at the Sydney Energy Forum. Um, it's like the politicians like talking about it, set the tone, which is needed and very good. I'm not criticizing that. I love the fact they're talking about batteries and minerals, put it that way. But um, the reality is that then they have to go province by province and, and actually work, like, work on the pipeline, how these things are permitted, and shorten it by 10x. Seems to be this order of magnitude issue that we're facing. But actually, view it for a new lens. Just do it for critical minerals that you're going to need to build these batteries. Um, then it you know, unlocks money into mining. Um, the gigafactories will then be built either here or just over the, over the, border, in, um, uh, over the border from you know, Detroit, let's say, uh, in, in, on the east coast of Canada. Um, and all of a sudden, then, a, a, an advanced materials industry becomes. It just mm -hmm. happens because it takes seven, ten years to build a mine. If all goes well, it takes, you could probably do it in five years. Um, if all goes really well, it takes 24 months to build a battery plant. And then those chemical uh, steps in the middle actually can happen quite quickly if those two pillars are there. Canada can dominate this upstream. Mm -hmm. um, it's just they've got to unlock that value, uh, unlock that process by addressing permitting and we shall wait and see, I guess. Christina, I feel like uh, the question up the top here is picked up. You, you talked about by design earlier in your conversation. So safety by design and the expectation and raising the bar in that regard. We've got a question here around the recycling piece. What are your thoughts on how the battery industry can create recycling by design into creation and the ability to reuse them after? How much is that part of the thinking at the moment? So for me, it has been, I've been part of the sustainability discussion my whole life. Mm. I wrote my first op-ed when I was 15. My, you are actually affectionately referred to as the queen of batteries, so she's not kidding. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration. <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's, it's in the design that I presented today. You just take those apart, you roll out, and you strip, and it's so easy to do. The idea to work actively with governments for sustainable and better processing and mining is absolutely here. I also serve on the board, public board, US listed company of Livent, which is lithium, a lithium content company that owns mines and works across North America, brings old processing, best practice, sustainability ideas, really expert team on chemical processing into the regions where they are active. Mm. This comes down to collaboration, working with partners locally, obligation for those who know to engage and teach and share and just hustle a little harder. So the clean in clean energy can't happen overnight. We are making a huge mistake if we all come to this thinking, we're gonna shut down the old paradigm. No, no, no. We are gonna invite into a dance that can be so amazing. It has to involve the fossil fuel paradigm. It has to involve the infrastructure we already have. We have an electricity problem in addition to a climate change problem. We have an economic problem in addition to a climate change problem. We have to find ways for transitions, and we can make it simple. Mm. Every new investment can be more sustainable. And if we make that as consumers, and we influence our governments, and we influence our companies, we will tip the scale in no time. In fact, I joke with my friends at BNEF all the time. I think they're late, they're behind. The, every year we get revisions that we did better than they thought. And yet, I'm with you. We're not fast enough, but yeah. it's happening. So I think there's no space in this discussion for depression or just giving up, resigning, we will all die. Not true. This is a time to step up the game. Uh, picking up on collaboration, Olivia, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned towards the end of your presentation, you were talking about the role of international organizations, and you were speaking about uh, specifically the idea of enforceable treaties and the role of the UN and things like that. Bruno McKay's yesterday on our stage in a geopolitical conversation spoke about his lack of confidence in our existing international organizations to help us navigate some of these energy challenges. And I think it kind of gets at the heart of um, one of the questions there, how clean is clean when mining is going to be located in countries that are currently weak in regulations, community engagement, poor governance? We know there's a role for international actors to have to play. We know there's a responsibility that comes with being an energy consumer and maybe not where things are being mined and processed. What, can you talk to me about the role of international organisations, where you think that leadership's going to come from, who needs to step up, or what needs to be created to play the role that we need in leading this global effort? 
It's a great question, um, and the answer to a certain extent is very simple and at the same time very complex. <laughs> the simple part is international institutions are what we make of them. Yep, agreed. And one of the reasons why it's been really difficult for the UN system, for example, to address the, what I like to call the nuts and bolts of decarbonization is that it doesn't really have a mandate to do so. <laughs> We have the UNFCCC in which we discuss, for example, mitigation pledges, but they're pledges. I have never heard about conversations taking place at COPs which are about how do we actually decarbonize? How do we organize the supply chains? How do we deliver on the mitigation targets and therefore those fluffy pledges? And the UN wants to have a role, for that matter, um, Secretary General Gutierrez is extremely mobilized on this question of critical raw materials and their potential impact in terms of the future of peace, the future of sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. But as long as we forbid um, international institutions essentially to really look into things that states usually consider as part of their fundamental competency, which is about competitiveness, industrial strategies, and therefore competition between countries, then there will be some conflicts essentially as to how we can deliver from an international governance perspective. It doesn't mean, however, that we cannot move into the direction that's needed and there are you know, different houses within the UN system to rely upon. Most notably, and this is really important, the UN Environment Programme, for example, is the one institution within the UN family that has an ecosystems-based mandate, not a national frontier-based mandate. It is not delivering on countries, it is delivering on ecological integrity. And this is why they are one of the actors taking up you know, this issue of decarbonization. But I just wanna quickly talk about the sort of how clean is clean question. Mm. Again, two parts answers. Mining is not clean. It has never been, it will never be. So we have to take this into account and we have to sort of, you know, shake our thinking around the green aspect and, you know, like being on the good part of history because we all drive EVs. But there are different aspects or relative shades of clean. And this scarf that I'm wearing comes from Madagascar. I was there two months ago on a mission to indeed sort of look at the risks associated to transition mining. And there is a story unfolding there that has to do with the scramble for resources that I was talking about. Companies that are stock market listed usually tend to perform better on environmental, social, and governance standards, but they tend to have an approach to risk, political risks in countries that tend to refrain them from investing into environments that are not very stable for investments. That means that the supply chains for countries like Canada are essentially at risk. On the other hand, countries that tend to support state-owned enterprises tend to send companies that do not have a lot of regard for ESG standards. Their track record is tremendously negative. And the ways in which they gain access to mining deposits and mining permits is through vast amount of corruption, which essentially entertain a very, very negative feedback loop within those countries where UN institutions have a lot of trouble containing the level of violence and corruption afterwards. So there needs to be a really strong strategy on the part of here, Canada, for example, the Canadian government, but not just them. Mm. It's Canada with Europe. It's Canada with the US. It's Canada with Japan. Mm. And it's Canada with all of those countries that are at the heart of the scramble for resources to try and determine how to give a better value proposition. Yeah, jump in, Simon. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. There is a, um, you're seeing it, a trade block emerging for the, the development of these minerals, these raw materials. You see it with, um, and the US actually, US and Australia at present are kind of driving it. The US has done its own thing. Um, you can Google that, they're partnering with, um, they, the US even now classify Canada, the UK, Australia, a few other countries as domestic resources to hand money out. That's kind of like a, a big move for the critical minerals thing. Australia is doing its own thing in the Asia Pacific, uh, Google that. Um, and you're getting this kind of international trade block. But interestingly, these countries, the EU is doing its own thing. China is doing its own thing. There was some discussion with the US and the EU recently, but it's kind of three distinct areas. 
that are, are developing um, on the geopolitical sense. So it'll be interesting how these three regions interact and grow as we go forward. I think it's really important, uh, I agree with this, uh, and it's very important also to keep in mind if we believe globalization is dead, it will be dead. It is our obligation to make globalization work. We are in this in so many ways together. We're tied. Whether you happen to be born in a rich country or a poor country, climate change affects you. Equality affects you. The opportunity to be a good citizen affects you. You have more means. We came here today to basically have a dialogue and a discussion. Globalization is not dead. That is also on our agenda. We have to reach out. We have to be a little kinder, a little more collaborative, a little bit more generous. This is really critical. Globalization is not dead. This is an absolute power panel, but would you believe we're nearly out of time? So I just wanted to close by asking each of our panelists for a closing thought, something for our audience to go away thinking about. I hope for a lot of people this has taken you into new territories of the battery conversation that you may not have explored before. It'll give you a new criticality when you're reading the extraordinary volume of articles and news stories we're seeing about batteries and EVs on a daily basis at the moment or prices of lithium and things like that. But just something to, to finish and, and close with. Nico, I might come to you first and I'll go along the panel. Sure, uh, what I'd like to always mention is that I think we have it wrong when it's us versus China, when it's who's going to be the winner in this energy transition. I, I believe there's got to be a lot of winners, you know, a lot of winners in order to even achieve a modicum of what we're going to need to be able to decarbonize the world, right? De decarbonize our decarbonization goal. So that's it. Don't get too stuck with the idea of the ideological thing about hugging the trees. There's a pragmatic approach to this. And also, as a banker, don't get stuck. Am I betting, am I betting on the winning horse? You want a lot of winning horses, so that's how I kind of look at it. Olivia? Um, I suppose one parting thought, two, maybe. Um, the first one is, let's make sure that we ask ourselves constantly the right questions. Let's make sure that we step away from linear thinking. Linear thinking in the face of climate crisis is really not helpful. Whatever solution we're going to develop, particularly in energy intensive countries, is going to create some impacts, so-called negative externalities elsewhere, because we're all connected. The other part thing is how do we want to be connected? Globalization is not dead. Globalization will, only, will always be there because, well, we share one planet. But what are the values that sustain globalization today? And this is the big question also related to China. China is not necessarily a problem in terms of leading the race, it's what China uses its power for in terms of leading the race. So if it is able to weaponize supply chains against you know, human rights, for example, then I don't want this type of globalization on a personal level, and I hope that you don't want it either. Mm. Simon? Yeah, just on lithium-ion batteries as a technology, Traditional lithium-ion batteries, NCM, LFP, they're getting better, cheaper, and abundant. That path is set. Uh, that's a 90%. Don't let the 10% distract you. 10% is going to happen, solid state, other chemistries, especially in the energy storage market. But traditional lithium-ion is here to stay, uh, and that's where the money's going. Bring it home. Thank you. So with an opportunity to collaborate and do big things, I would just say, use the data. Search for the data. Look for the testing, make sure you stay in the game. And for those of you who came maybe with an idea that it's already over or I don't have to care, care. This is our time. Thank you. Wow, some big closing food for thought there. Can you join me in thanking our truly phenomenal panel and speakers this morning? Nico, Olivia, Simon and Christina, thank you so much.